Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. Researching this sermon made me feel sick. I took 26 pages of notes on David Duke, Richard Spencer, Stephen Bannon, Andrew Breitbart, Milo Yiannopoulos, and all the president-elect's men. I am trying to understand the ascendancy of a white supremacist to the office of the President of the United States. My friends of color, my own children of color, are not particularly surprised. It makes them feel sick too, but they are used to feeling sick and frightened and angry. Richard Rose, president of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP says, this is just the latest chapter in America's tortured history of race relations. America has never repudiated white supremacy, he says. America has normalized white supremacy and racial oppression. Richard Spencer, who heads the white nationalist think tank known innocuously as the National Policy Institute, coined the term alternative right or alt-right to describe a set of far-right ideals centered on white identity and the so-called preservation of Western civilization, a vision of societally fundamentally determined by race. Under no terms, should we ever dignify that ideology by using that term? It is white supremacy, the cesspool origin of racism. The very first thing we need to agree to do is to name it and call it what it is. Instead of the innocuous sounding alt-right, let us say white supremacist. Let us say neo-Nazi with an expanded agenda, fascist, ultranationalist, xenophobic, ableist, anti-immigration, anti-Mexican, anti-Semitic, homophobic and transphobic, Islamophobic, sexist. Perhaps like some of you, I made the terrible mistake of thinking of white supremacists as some kind of fringe element. I shook my head at their paramilitary campaigns organized around hashtag white genocide or hashtag I salute white people or laughably I thought hashtag boycott Star Wars 7 that's the 2015 Star Wars The Force Awakens, protesting the casting of John Boyega, a black man, in a leading role. I was right that their beliefs have no place in the American dream. But I was wrong, sometimes fatally wrong, that they are mere fringe. This presidential election was a referendum on hate and hate won. Our president-elect is a hero to white supremacists. First, we name it. Then, we stop it. Journalist Shane Burley and Alexander Reed Ross made a terrific in-depth study of the work anti-racists did to defeat David Duke former Ku Klux Klan Grand Dragon and founder of the National Association for the Advancement of White People in his bid for the United States Senate. 
It started 25 years ago when the Louisiana Coalition Against Racism and Nazism formed to stop Duke in bids for both U.S. Senator and Louisiana Governor. The coalition was bipartisan. It included progressives and Republicans who repudiated Duke's racist ideology. They supported three initiatives. First, co-founder Lance Hill created a research file on Duke defining his personal and political profile, an expose of his neo-Nazi and Holocaust denial books. The coalition made it into a packet and turned it over to the media. Second, as part of her Tulane University PhD dissertation on the fourth generation of the KKK, Evelyn Rich had interviewed Duke extensively. She made these damning tapes available. And third, Louisiana Republican State Central Committee Secretary Beth Rickey documented Duke's efforts to befriend her using explicitly racist appeals, including a recording she made of him speaking to a meeting of Nazis. Over the course of several Duke campaigns, he just kept coming back. The coalition ran ads highlighting what would happen to Louisiana if Duke won. The threat of economic boycott by the rest of the country protesting white nationalism proved powerful. Nonetheless, Duke polled at 60% by Louisiana's white voters. He was only defeated by a massive black-led get-out-the-vote campaign among black voters who had not traditionally cast ballots. And so the Louisiana Coalition Against Racism created the Southern Institute for Education and Research. They ran work workshops for teachers in rural Louisiana and the surrounding states in the South on how to shape the moral values of young children in those communities. No one is born racist. They mobilized Holocaust survivors to help teachers develop lesson plans. And Duke faded out until he saw his opening in the 2016 campaign for the presidency. 25 years after its inception, the Louisiana Coalition Against Racism reactivated. Once again, they exposed Duke's racism, although this time Duke made it easy with his openly Nazi talking points. But they knew that Duke has a hidden vote. He underpolls, and they remained vigilant. Indeed, he qualified to participate in the Senate candidates' debate, and you will remember that beyond all imagining, he appeared on stage at Dillard University, a historically black college. Although he lost that election once again, we know that his agenda did not. Sometimes stopping white supremacy is organized and methodical and persistent and effective. And sometimes, especially when it comes without warning, sudden and shocking, we have to stand up for everything we believe, stand on the side of love, and respond from our hearts. On November 18th, members of the National Policy Institute gathered to celebrate Trump's election at Maggiano's Little Italy in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Video of the event shows Richard Spencer shouting, Hail Trump! And in response, audience members extending stiff arms in the Sieg Heil, Hail Victory, Nazi salute. Word got out, courageous protesters arrived, and the restaurant was forced to close. Steve Provost, president of Magianos, explained that the restaurant had no idea whom they were hosting. The banquet reservation had been made that afternoon, last minute, under a different name, by someone claiming it was for a family reunion. This expression of support of Hitler is extremely offensive to us, he wrote, as our restaurant is home to teammates and guests of every race, religion, and cultural background. We want to sincerely apologize to the community of Friendship Heights for inadvertently hosting this meeting, which resulted in hateful sentiment. When NPR's Robin Young interviewed Steve Provost, I experienced the first flicker of hope since the election. 
that really, really offended us, he said. That image was deeply offensive. That is not consistent with our values. We embrace and welcome everyone. If you've ever worked in a scratch kitchen, you've got a dishwasher from Ethiopia, you've got a line cook from the Philippines, you've got a prep cook from Mexico, you have to suspend all biases and people work together for one common cause. Honestly, he says, I'm not a politician. I'm a restaurant person. I know how to make a marinara sauce and make guests feel special. What they did is really awful. That's why we took the extraordinary action of closing down the restaurant, and that's why Maggiano's donated the profits from their sales that day, $10,000, to the Anti-Defamation League. That flicker of hope has grown into a flame. Last week in Zion, Illinois, Deania Ford, age 21, reported that she and her two children were at a Dairy Queen where James Crichton, the owner of the franchise, quote, called me and my children a racial slur. He said I can go back to where I came from. Deania's three-year-old immediately repeated the racial slur. A police report released Thursday says that Crichton proudly admitted to using the slur and said he would be happy to go to jail over the issue. Dairy Queen Corporate took swift action to terminate, terminate his franchise rights and issued a statement which says, in part, the recent actions of this franchisee are inexcusable, reprehensible, unacceptable, and do not represent the values of Dairy Queen. We expect our franchisees and their employees to treat every single person who walks through their doors with the utmost dignity and respect. Nothing less is acceptable. The restaurant will be closed until further notice. This is how we're going to defeat white supremacy. Sometimes one campaign at a time and sometimes one gesture at a time. It matters when we refuse to remain silent collectively and individually, when we speak up, call, post, say what we see and hear, and interfere. And there's one more thing. In the midst of all the very grim news of these past months, stories surfaced of people's minds being changed. By the time he was 16, Christian Picciolini had been kicked out of four high schools. He became involved with Chicago area skinheads, the first neo-Nazi skinhead organization in the United States. They promised me paradise, he says. They promised me that the bullies would go away, that my life would get better, that I'd have the family I was looking for, and that I would have a sense of purpose. Christian Picciolini took on a leadership role helping to shape the white supremacist movement here. In the mid-1990s, he ran a record store called Chaos Records, known for its collection of white power music. But other people shopped there too, the kind of people he'd spent years hating. There was no light bulb moment. It was just that the more he spoke with those customers, the harder it was to justify his hate-filled beliefs. And it didn't take long for him to abandon the white supremacist movement and begin to make amends. If we live as if we believe that no one is beyond redemption, someone just might be redeemed. We will be better for it. And the world will be better for it. Christian sees, he says, how the movement has changed its tactics by design. White supremacy is trying to make itself more palatable. Don't get tattooed, don't shave your head, stop wearing a clan hood, don't wave a swastika flag, he says. Wear a suit and tie, go to college, blend in and mainstream the ideology. 
That's what we're seeing now. Christian Picciolini went on to co-found Life After Hate and spends his days helping others to leave extremist movements and leave behind lives of violence and hatred. Beloved spiritual companions, America has normalized white supremacy and racial oppression. First, we need to name it. And then, we need to stop it. Let us create coalitions of good-hearted people and expose the hate. Let us educate ourselves, equip our teachers, and especially seek to shape the moral values of young children. No one is born racist. Let us be organized and methodical and persistent and effective. Let us stand up for what we believe, stand on the side of love, and respond from our hearts. It matters when we refuse to remain silent, when we speak up, call, post, say what we hear, say what we see, and interfere. And if we live as if we believe that no one is beyond redemption, someone just might be redeemed. I close with the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr whose 88th birthday we celebrate today, whose legacy we honor this weekend, who lived and died to defeat white supremacy. In his speech, Beyond Vietnam, given April 4th, 1967, he said, now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God, and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say that the odds are too great? Shall we tell them that the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life mitigate against our arrival as full men, and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost. The choice is ours. And though we might prefer it otherwise, in this crucial moment of human history, we must choose. So help us, God. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. We would love to hear from you via email at office at ASCBoston.org or through our Facebook page. If you would like to support the good work of Arlington Street Church, please consider a contribution by checking the mail or through our website, ASCBoston.org.